Hi Long Range Hunting and welcome to Budget Scope Reviews. Now, you guys might have noticed it's been about a month since I posted. I planned on having, you know, more content than that. Um, my grandpa, as you saw, passed away from the uh, little dedication there. You know, good guy. Passed right before his 90th birthday. So, naturally, I took some time off to deal with all that. Go to the funeral. You know, send him off. And uh, he was a good guy. Korean War vet. Lifetime hunter. Solid dude. Absolute badass. So... Uh, for my military peeps out there, you want to raise a glass to a badass, I'd appreciate it. Rest in peace, Grandpa. We have the watch. Now, a little uh, reminder of why I'm doing this. Uh, I get a lot of requests on budget scopes, but since I fund myself, I don't take sponsors or anything like that. Anything I have is either somebody's let me borrow, I'm using it with them, or I have to buy it. So it's kind of hard to do stuff like this, especially since I got out of the uh, budget stuff a long time ago. I found it's much better to simply buy once, cry once, get the good stuff. Um, and so I've been out of the game on the cheap end stuff for quite a while. However, stuff has come a long way in the last you know few years, even the last decade. Um, so budget scopes aren't what they used to be. And so is the same thing with the top tier. Like, Spent and Bender used to be the top, the elite. And now you got stuff that even puts that to shame. And that's saying something because those are amazing optics. So, fortunately, I have a good buddy, Logan. He was willing to send me this. Most companies aren't going to do that because they only want to get positive reviews. So, if anybody is going to give an honest and fair review, 99.9% .9 of them aren't going to do it. Now, he is not a scope company. He's a fellow YouTuber. Um, you can check out his stuff. I'll put his uh, YouTube link in the description below. Um, and he just owns a scope store. So he sells scopes. He's not affiliated with anybody. And he said, hey, you know what? I'll send you stuff. You review it. Good or bad. Doesn't matter. Just give it an honest review. So Logan, I appreciate you helping me out because it actually makes stuff like this possible where really before I wasn't going to just go buy one of these just to test it out. So let's dive into it and get started. All right, let's dive into the specs. Now, first, I'm going to cover the rifle real quick because I know I'm going to get questions about it. And as it has to do with the testing that I did, I want to cover it. Now, this is a custom built uh, rifle by Tactical Rifles. I have it for 11 years. It's a 308 Winchester. It was running a 168 grain ELD match at uh, 2,710 feet per second. Um, it's basically a M40 Alpha 1 modified, which was a Marine Corps sniper rifle. Um, the stock is a McMillan A1 TAC 3. And so instead of the Alpha 1, this one has a higher cheek weld. It's also got a squared forend instead of a rounded. Um, and it also takes the uh, detachable magazines and four plate. Um, I find it a lot better. I like to have those magazines versus an internal. Um, having the cheek weld a little bit higher is really nice. And doing this is nice for uh, barricades, any of that. Um, it's got a higher bipod. It's a Remington 700 Action Trued and Blueprinted. Um, I had a new bolt put in that's fluted with an oversized bolt knob. It's got a 24-inch 1 in 10 twist barrel. Uh, there's no break on this, which is 
one of the reasons I ran it on this because I wanted something with some recoil. Um, it's just been a great old gun. Again, over 14,000 rounds, still shoots lights out. Uh, you can tell it's had some wear to it, and it's it's a solid rifle. I uh, It's one that you can just grab onto and you know you're going to hit. Now onto the scope. This is a EPL4. Um, this is a lightweight version of the EP. Uh, that's what the L on the end stands for, is lightweight. It comes in at 24 ounces, which... You know, some people really like that. Um, if you want to lose some weight, you can take off the sunshade. It does come with that. Um, so not a very uh, heavy scope to begin with. It's got a milled uh, turret and reticle. The mill reticle is the VHR. Uh, the illuminated part of the reticle is in red. Uh, it goes from one to six on that. The elevation turret itself is in 10th mil adjustments and it's got uh, eight mils per full revolution, full turn. And it says, according to their website, that you get 20 mils of travel. Um, that is the maximum you can get. I did not get that. Um, once you've zeroed it and set that zero stop, you're gonna have to check. So basically you're just gonna dial up until you run out and that's gonna tell you how much you actually have. So the setup on this rifle, I've actually got 15.8 mils for elevation. Anything past that, I'm gonna to have to use the mill reticle in order to go higher than that as far as getting more uh, drop and utilizing the reticle. Now this has Japanese glass. Uh, it's called ELD, Extraordinary Low Dispersion. Now, something to point out, I see this a lot. I even had somebody who was trying to hire me a scope company um, that produce cheaper optics and they were trying to give the sales pitch of oh well you know there's only three factories out there all the glass came, comes from the same place what you're just getting overcharged for stuff like the smitten benders tangent all that um, you can get the same thing with my cheap scope not true what's true is there's only a few factories that do it and they supply everybody but people try to use that as validation. It comes from the same place, it's the same thing. My product's just as good, and that's absolute bogus. That is complete BS. Those scope companies are gonna go over there and they're gonna pick based on the quality of glass, and that's a whole rabbit hole to dive into, but they're gonna look and say, okay, I want this for this price, I'll take this, is what we're gonna put in. And so you get the low end stuff and the high end stuff, and they're gonna pay the difference if, you know, the better it is, the more expensive. And so it's not coming out of the factory the exact same. That is absolute, you know, BS on that. So don't be um, fooled by that. Uh, Japanese does make really good glass though. Uh, this one actually does pretty good in low light, but we'll talk about how it did in a second. Um, it's got a zero stop. Zero stop is very easy to set. Um, you know, you unscrew a few of these, these side ones you're going to do. And then you're gonna loosen this one here and get it set up. And then you're gonna tighten this down just barely and then tighten this down and you're good to go. And it's going to stop. It's got an eye relief of 3.5 inches, which is pretty standard. It's a good eye relief, um, easy to get on and set up for your rifle. Now your field of view, depending on your magnification is going to change. Um, at 100 yards on your lowest magnification, you got 18.55 feet of field of view. And on maximum 24, you're looking at 4.65 feet as far as your field of view. So it's gonna change in between as far as that goes. Uh, this is an FFP, a first focal plane scope, um, which is something that I like. I really like doing that. The reticle's always true. Um, it's got the nice milling reticle in there. It, it's actually not bad. To, I prefer a Christmas tree style, but it's not bad. It's 13.8 inches long. Now it's got external parallax, which is a good thing. On the parallax knob itself is your illumination. That goes from one to six. Um, on the other side of the scope, you have your windage turret, which is capped. Um, so you unscrew the cap and then you're going to see and be able to adjust your windage. Now, for those wondering what this is, and as far as price, this is $399 for this scope. So it's definitely in that budget range. Um, you know, honestly, scopes have come a long way. It used to be that budget scopes were all trash. The only exception to that 
and could actually like keep up with the other stuff was the Swift of Super Snipers. One guy even placed, I think he was third in the King of the Two Mile with one, and it was a $299 scope. But it wasn't, it was a fixed power, so there wasn't all the other stuff. Uh, it's a fixed 10 power or fixed uh, 16 power. Um, so turrets weren't the greatest, all that, but it did track, it did hold up, even on a 50 BMG. Um, so that was kind of the exception of the rule. Scopes, even the top ones like the Smith & Vendors have come a long way, and so have budget scopes like this. This, you know, 10 years ago is not what you would get for anywhere close to $400. Now let's dive in and I'm gonna show you guys the actual shooting from the field of results. Some of this is filmed on GoPro. Some of it is filmed through the Tacticam right here through the scope so you can see that. And some is filmed on the spotting scope. Now I ended up taking this out uh, to multiple distances. I did both dialing and holding to verify for tracking. Um, you know, did all of that. Went out to 1100 yards with it and you know, it. It did good, but I'm going to let you guys watch this footage. You can see um, different hits, and I'll have the yardages on there, and then we'll jump back into this. Now that you've watched that, uh, let's talk about the different factors. We're gonna do the pros and the cons. So we're gonna do the pros first. Um, pros, the turrets, they're nice, they're big. Um, you can really grab onto them. I personally like them a little bit bigger, um, but it's not bad size. You can grab onto it even with a glove um, and you know turn it. Um, when you do turn it, it does stick to you know whatever hash mark you're on there. It's not slipping. It's you know a positive adjustment. You can feel it. Uh, there's no slippage, and you know through the entire revolution because you get some that will kind of not quite get there, and then the line on the uh, turret and the line below it aren't lining up perfectly. Um, didn't have that problem with this. I went and did both dialing, as I said, and I did holds for that. Um, that 500 yard one, it was a great example of what this rifle can do and that scope. Um, you saw I put two rounds right on top of each other. Uh, we took it out to 1100 yards, really put it through its paces. I shot 80 something rounds during the day and filmed all this. Um, I played with it before, but there were some hiccups with footage, so I went back out and did it. Uh, the reticle being a millimeter reticle, it, it's 
good for those who don't like busy reticles like a Horus or a Christmas tree. Um, I like those personally, but this is not actually a bad uh, reticle. It's in half mil uh, increments as far as the reticle goes. And, you know, you can clearly see it um, if you know what you're doing. I do like that little dot. Um, you know, it had good enough optical clarity to where I could put that dot where I wanted it and send that round. Um, you saw at the very beginning with the uh, cardboard target, what I was doing there is getting this thing, you know, sighted in, making sure it was good, set and zero stop, all that. Because I pulled it off of a different gun, but it really did well. You can see the hole above, that was the first shot. I dialed down from there and shot that dot, um, landed right on there, and then I put three more rounds there after I uh, set the zero stop. So I shot the first one, adjusted down, shot, it hit the dot. So I went ahead and slipped the turrets did my uh, zero stop, and then did a verification for three more rounds right on top of each other. Um, and that was at 100 yards, and then I went out to distance from there. The turret elevation, um, honestly, I'd like more, to be honest, realistically, uh, only getting 15.8. You know, that'll on a 308, that'll get you, you know, you're not going to run out of it. And for most people, it's not going to be an issue because you're never going to shoot to the point where you're getting to run out of 15.8 mils. Um, I do extended range stuff also, and so even with some of the bad boys like that with the bigger tubes for more adjustment, I can run out. So for the average person, even on a 308, if you're shooting a thousand yards, this will do it perfect. You have more than enough to do that. Um, if you're shooting even longer, you know, it could become a problem at some point, but at no point during the day did I run out of elevation. That's just a personal assessment and preference of mine, but you know, it's got good range as far as that goes. Um, and again, it tracked perfectly going up and down. It tracked perfectly for my holds when I would hold um, for the shot. So I'd shoot, you know, dialed and then shoot hold to verify that it lines up. Now the optical clarity. Now that footage was not on a bright sunny day. It was super overcast. You couldn't see the sun. It was more low light conditions. And you can see that it's, you know, it's not bad. Even at a thousand yards, I could see my impacts. I didn't have any problem of trying to figure out where they are, which a lot of cheap scopes, you're not going to be able to. Heck, I've been behind some high dollar scopes where you struggle to see exactly where it's, uh, your hits are. So optical quality is a big deal. Um, so it, it works really well for the price. I'm amazed at what the glass is, to be honest. Um, it, it, it does really well um, as far as that. You know, so low light, I've done that, and even lower light, it seems to hold up really well. Um, I'll probably get some footage for you guys later on, you know, during a nice sunny day. I've done that, and it definitely looks better than what we were seeing at the range that day. But again, it was super overcast, it rained at one point, so it wasn't ideal conditions, but when is it ever? Especially for hunting. So that gives you a better idea of some lower light conditions, what it's going to look like. Now, this is only 24 ounces. If you take the sunshade off, it's going to be um, a little more compact. So if you're looking for a lightweight type scope for a lightweight rifle, this will do it. And it says it's rated up to 50 BMG, so it should be able to withstand any of the recoil you'll throw at it. Um, this has no break, which I wanted some recoil, which makes it hard for getting back on target on a camera and showing you guys. Um, but it does really good on testing how it's going to hold up, even with the rings. Now, we do have a pretty solid power range. Optical clarity is actually what matters, but, you know, the higher you go in magnification, uh, the less optical quality you're going to get. Uh, that's something a lot of people don't understand. Cheap scopes have done this thing where they put really high power settings to try to make up for their glass quality. And the problem is it's, it's going to be its best at the lower end. And so the higher you go, the worse it's going to be. And so anytime I see cheaper scopes with higher magnifications, it's kind of like a red flag. This one actually did pretty good. Um, during this, I was shooting on about 15 power through the entire day just to you know show you guys more realistically what we're going to be doing instead of on the low end. So if you go lower, the quality is going to appear better, but I wanted to use a standard you know, long range power setting and test it out on that higher power. So it did really well. Um, even with the trigger cam with this um, lever, you can still do it. It doesn't interfere. It's nice and smooth. It's positive. 
it doesn't like get stuck, it's not too easy and you let go of it, it's going to stay there, you don't have to worry about it really moving. Um, with a first focal plane, it doesn't matter what power you're on, you can shoot and those uh, mills are going to be true. So, you know, that is nice, it's got a nice power range um, and you can easily adjust it and not have to worry about, you know, having to crank it or, you know, make your scope unlevel or something like that. Now let's get to the cons of this scope. Now, first thing first, and this isn't really the scope itself, it has to do with it, but this um, anti-cant device or level, I'm not a fan of it. It's something I see with cheap ones, as you're gonna see this, and that happened multiple times during the day when I was shooting. It would, the bubble would split open, and you couldn't get a good, nice level until that set back up and usually I could do it by shooting and getting that recoil or just shaking the gun and getting it to reset but that's not something you want when you're you know trucking around the mountains uh, bouncing around and then you can't get a good you know level to know if you're good or not so if you're going to get a scope like this I highly recommend spending the money and getting something like a flatline off or a better anti-cant device I mean these little packages are cool and all the rings seem pretty decent, uh, but this level is absolutely terrible in my opinion. I just, I really didn't like it. It just seemed to be more of a problem than anything else. Now, parallax is the next thing that is a con. Um, I like having a side parallax. I don't like the front ones, but it's really stiff and that runs into problems of you should be able to move it and it's, you know, if you let go, it's not going to move. If you bump into something, it's not going to move. But you should be able to smoothly move it. You don't need to be cranking on it to try to get it to move. Um, and this one is actually pretty stiff. Now, this one only goes to 200, and then it goes to the affinity. Now, the numbers don't matter. That is just something people need to understand. Those numbers are not going to work. Parallax is a phenomenon that happens when you're under magnification, where your reticle and the target are in two different focal planes. So an easy way to explain that is take this knuckle, this knuckle, line it up like a crosshair in front of you, about six inches in front of your face, and move your head. And you're gonna see the relation of this knuckle moving. Now, if you stick them together, no matter where you move your head, it's sitting there. And that's what parallax is. And so when you adjust parallax, you're moving your target in the reticle to the same focal plane. And so it doesn't matter where you move behind it, it's going to stay on target. And so the numbers are never right. It's just one of those things they're not. Um, even on something like that Smitten Bender, the numbers aren't always right. Uh, that's probably the closest I've seen, but it's one of those things I never understood. Some scope companies will just put dots on there. Um, but that being said, even with the 200, it's a very small parallax adjustment as far as the amount turned. Um, even with high dollar scopes, when you get to a certain distance, when you get into extended range, you're not going to be able to take all the parallax out. And that's something, you know, you want as much parallax out. Not all scopes can achieve it. Some will get remove all parallax, some will get very close. How you check that is you get on target, uh, you get on the gun, and without moving the gun, just slowly bob your head up, you don't want to influence it, and watch that reticle bounce and adjust that parallax until it stops moving or as close as possible. And that's how you set your parallax. Um, it has a very short range, and so instead of like with that one, you know, I'm not hitting that problem stage till about 1400 where I'm not able to remove all of the parallax and pass that. Now with this, it's about six to 700 yards is where I'm starting to be where I can't remove all of it. Um, how much is left? I mean, we're not talking about a big amount. It's very small. Um, you're just getting a tiny bit of movement. As long as you're consistent on your gun, you're not gonna have a problem with that. Shot fine out to a thousand yards, but this is not something I would recommend people taking uh, to extended ranges. Uh, that parallax just being a very small adjustment, very stiff, I'm not a big fan. Uh, the illumination next to it is another thing. Um, it's nice to have illuminated reticle if you're doing low light stuff. The only problem is, is a lot of these cheap scopes will overpower them. And so realistically, the only one I could use is one and two. And basically one, because if not, the brightness was so intense that it's basically blowing the whole thing out. And so you can't use those higher end ones to really do anything, especially in low light conditions, because all you're gonna see is that glare. Now, as I stated before, it is a decent amount of travel. Um, 
I do like more, so I do count that as kind of a downside. It doesn't have as much uh, vertical adjustment as I would like. Again, it's limited by the 30 millimeter tube, but I would like to see more. And also, I dislike the eight per revolution. I would like to see something more like 10. If you need something like 20 mils, you can just do two full rotations. Um, instead of, if I need nine mils, I'm having to do one full rotation and then count one. Um, going in tens makes it a lot easier. That's just kind of, again, a personal preference thing. Um, so for most people, it's not going to matter. They're not even going to know the difference, but it makes it a little less confusing for people when you have it something like 10 mils. But again, I'm just, I'm nitpicking based on my experience. Now, I do not like capped windages. I like exposed turrets like this on both the uh, elevation and windage. And the other thing that I really don't like about this, and I've seen it with other cheap scopes, these two turrets feel completely different. Um, this one is solid, but it definitely is not, you know, like that. Um, you're not slipping, but it's pretty smooth in between. I like it a little more distinct, whereas the windage is that distinct. It feels like two different scopes turrets. And you really don't touch this much because you're just going to zero and then hold it basically unless you're dialing it. Um, but it, it felt weird. I'm not a big fan of them feeling different. If I do both of those turrets, they feel the exact same where my Night Force or any of my other scopes. So um, I know a lot of people are just holding the wind. So do I. So I rarely touch the windage. On occasion, I will dial. But I'm not a fan of this. I'd rather have it exposed. I'm not having to like twist it off in the moment or do anything like that. So some people like it. I'm not a big fan of that. Now, one thing I did run into, and this is not exclusive to cheap scopes. I've had it with higher end scopes and stuff during training. When you're doing uh, UKD, which is unknown distance uh, training, you're gonna sit there and you're going to do what's called milling the target, where you're using your reticle, you're putting it over the target, and you're using that unit of measurement in the scope to do a formula and calculate the distance to the target. Now, when we do that milling, when you're on the outside of the scope, those mills can be slightly off. Um, some scopes will have little hash marks on the, uh, that are smaller increments on the outer side of the reticle. That way it's easier to get those more refined and you're not having to guess as much if you have larger spacing in between your mills. Um, you know, half mill versus tenth mill adjustments. Um, and the problem is, is once you get to those edges, the curvature in the glass can actually cause those mills to be slightly off. Generally, it's on the high side, it's be a little bit more than what it's supposed to be. Now, with this first focal plane scope, when I zoom in and I go to do a hold, if it's in this bottom section right here, I'm starting to get that. And so, if you want to be completely accurate, you're going to want your reticle, if you're going to do hold, zoom out a little bit and use the reticle that doesn't hit that point, and it's going to be on. Now, I did use it to the point on the edges to test it on different distances. And it's only a tenth off. So all you gotta do if you do that is shave a tenth off. So let's say I need, if I dial, I dial 7.1 mils and I go to hold 7.1. Well, it's gonna be a little bit off. So all I need to do is actually hold seven instead of 7.1. So it's a little bit off on that but it's not a big deal. Um, it's just something to be aware of. And so if you just simply back out a little bit and move that, you know, because the reticle is going to grow and shrink. And so if you get it to that point where it's above that, you're not going to have a problem. If you do get that, just shoot it and verify. And just, you know, if you, the one you have is like this one and you're just a tenth off, you know, just calculate that out if you, you know, absolutely need it on that power setting. So, you know, that is something that I've seen with quite a few scopes, even some of the, you know, higher end stuff that I've used, like when I was going through that training. Um, so it's just something to be aware of um, as far as your holds, because once you get out to distance, that tenth can really make a difference. So um, the other thing is these. I really dislike these scope caps. Now, it came with two styles. It came with the bikini style, um, which are all right. And you got these. Now, this is a weird type of rubber, and you have to stretch it and get it over. It's really quite a pain in the ass to get on and off. Um, it definitely holds on really well uh, once you get it on there. It ain't moving, but it's unnecessarily hard to get on. If you just get something like Butter Creek, they're hard 
they fit really nice and they don't move. So this was a royal pain to deal with. They're super cheap. I know we're talking about cheap optics, but if you're gonna, just like the level, if you're gonna get something like this, get some better scope caps, just buy them. It's gonna really, you know, save you some frustration and uh, issues. In conclusion, it's a very solid scope, to be honest. Scopes have come a very, very long way. Um, you know, budgets today are way better than some of the mid-level scopes were back then, and all scope quality has gone up. I mean, that's across the board, a lot of new technology, um, certain things are becoming cheaper, more common. Um, so for the money, for $400 is a phenomenal scope. Um, as some of you know from the other video when I talked about it, I'm doing two assessments and ranking. I'm doing a budget scope ranking, which is $1,000 and under, and that's what this falls under. And then I'm going to be comparing all scopes. So this will compare like to the Smith and Bender, Tangent Athena, stuff like that. Um, so it's something that, you know, I want both rankings. So not only do you know in that bracket of budget scopes, you know, how it ranks up if that's your budget, or if you're looking at all scope period, where it ranks there also. So as far as under a thousand dollar budget scopes, I'm giving this an eight out of 10. Um, you know, there are some little things about it that, you know, are definitely dropping some stuff, but overall it's a very solid scope, especially for the money. Now for all scopes, including the Smitten Bender and all that, it's about a 5.5 is what I'm gonna rank it at. Um, so it's not, you know, incredible. It's not at the same level as that, but it's all, definitely not crap. Um, so it's right there in the middle as far as all scopes go. Um, but yeah, 5.5 out of 10 for all scopes for budget, 8 out of 10. It's, it's a pretty solid piece. I mean, honestly, if you're looking to shoot a thousand yards um, and you buy a nice rifle, I mean, I do recommend getting really good glass if you can, but let's say that's not possible or you simply don't want to, uh, you can definitely buy this scope, you know, put it on right out of the box and shoot it. And uh, as long as you and your gun are capable of it, it's more than capable of doing a thousand yards or even further. So, um, I mean, it's pretty crazy these days what you can get for a $400 price tag. It's pretty amazing to be um, honest, but uh, pretty solid scope. Now, I do have more coming as far as videos on this. I'm going to be doing a comparison against this and another scope that I've got coming in from uh, Logan. I've also got the thermal imaging scope that I'm going to be uh, doing some stuff. I still need to get out more and get more footage and stuff like that before. Uh, I've actually had these for a little while and been, you know, really taking it through paces. Um, the actual shooting footage you saw, I had 25 minutes of straight shooting off one camera. I was out there for the entire day, um, really putting it through its paces. But so far, I'm actually pretty impressed. I mean, am I still going to recommend top tier to anybody that asks? Absolutely. But if you're looking for a budget under a thousand, you can't go wrong. It's it's pretty good scope. Pros and cons, but you just got to weigh what you find acceptable. And some of this stuff is just me being picky because I'm used to the top tier stuff and I've used a lot of stuff. So uh, I hope you guys find this helpful. Um, you know, I'm going to keep plugging away at these. If you guys have any comments, suggestions, anything, drop in the comments below. Love hearing from you guys and everybody be safe out there. Happy hunting. Hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and turn on notification bell so you won't miss out on any future video. And happy hunting!